All right. Um, yep. Happy Halloween. Happy Thanksgiving. Right. Uh, anyone who's really into the Christmas spirit already, uh, you know, happy early holidays. Um, the uh, news to kick us off tonight um, before we get to the agenda. Um, and this one, I didn't even like check with Ashley and Tom. I realized that this is actually an anniversary of sorts. Um, November of last year in 2021 was the reboot after COVID. Um, the shy tug had basically like was on life support. Um, yeah, maybe we met right, it was like, we met right before COVID and then we tried one virtual during COVID and it, it was very anemic and it sort of uh, had gone dormant. So um, I'm definitely celebrating, right? It's a one year anniversary of bringing it back and it actually had quarterly tugs, which uh, I know is, is tough. Tough for any tug to do, um, and definitely was you know a, a challenge for us, but uh, I think we enjoyed it and had a good time. Uh, upcoming tugs, we don't have the whole year mapped out for next year, but we probably will do that as we uh, get ready for the new year. Um, but we can at least say we got the 1Q1 on our radar for February of 2023. Um, loosely, there's a theme that we're noodling around about building portfolios and the process of job hunting, what are recruiters looking for, you know, what, which one's more valuable, your resume versus your portfolio. Um, it was just a conversation that keeps coming up with people, keeps coming up among the three of us um, as coordinators, even just as we're hiring people, um, right? Uh, Melavika's with me somewhere in the room and uh, right, was that relevant today? Hello, you joining us? Oh, we just had now. Okay. Um, yeah, Discover folks uh, uh, making their way out. Um, the other theme that for uh, February, uh, if you remember, we did um, uh, Du Bois Challenge last year. I'm passionately interested in bringing it back. Everyone seems to be all thumbs up about it. Um, even moving the tug into February is to line the whole thing up with Black History Month in a city like Chicago. Makes sense, uh, right down the line. So um, kind of keep an eye out. We'll do something in January, not meeting base, but at least to figure out how to um, kick it off and get people participating. And then uh, during the tug, we'll, we'll do something with uh, what people put together. Um, since we didn't have a virtual one this year, um, largely we were trying to do it at Discover and Discover was sort of in this uh, on again, off again relationship with visitors during COVID. Um, so we are at least gonna do a happy hour. So two weeks from tonight, November 17th, four to six, uh, anybody wants to join us in Marshall Landings for a drink, I'll at least head down there at four and try to get that big table that's in front of the big video screen. So um, sw swing on by. Um, we'll definitely do at least like an email through the uh, system that's got everybody's email. So at least you got like one little nudge that's not just us uh, saying it here in the tug. And in case anyone's not aware, Marshall's Landing is the bar that's inside of the Merchandise Mart. Yeah, good like call. A bar cafe thing bar cafe in front of the uh, the jumbotron wall that they project on right next to the food court and the brown line stop. Yeah, good call it, Tom. That's a good call. All right. And then we always put this plug. Um, yeah, three of us are currently uh, doing well, going strong. No one's, uh, you know, missed any of their doctor appointments, but we could always use one more co-leader. Um, so yeah, if you're, um, you know, interested in uh, volunteering, um, I always get the question, like, what's the hardest part? Um, it's, 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 uh, it's one of the more fun ones, but it is the hard part is like, you know, um, I have an idea for like a, a topic that would be super cool. How do I go track somebody down who's actually like a speaker that would be willing to do it available, right? And all that stuff. But outside of that, the rest of it is uh, uh, just kind of like a fun hangout on Friday mornings with the, with the group. Um, so then tonight, last tug of the year, um, there was the huge announcement of the, the latest uh, cohort of Tableau uh, ambassadors and specifically Tableau public ambassadors. Uh, Elisa Davis is a close friend of uh, the community and the family for reasons that she will also introduce. Um, and she was uh, very open to uh, coming and talking to us about her journey um, and any advice. Um, I think also like being the week of Iron Viz, right? There might also be uh, some of those, those kind of conversations. Um, a topic that like, I'm always kind of uh, not amazed, but like every time we do it, I'm always impressed with like how well people are like, oh, that's cool. I always kind of knew some tidbits of data viz history. Um, but every time we kind of go back into the archives of like, you know, people used to do this without laptops. Um, yeah, it's always a fun topic. And uh, Ashley and Tom both had sort of different sections of like different angles of it. Um, and it worked out great to kind of uh, bring the two of them together. 
And then as we always do, um, I'm definitely interested in hanging out uh, all the way up to seven. So anybody wants to hang out and just chit chat and talk about job opportunities we've seen or, you know, what is Salesforce doing at Tableau this time? Um, I always love hanging out and uh, having those conversations. So that's our evening. So I will stop sharing and we will pass it over to Elisa Davis. Welcome, welcome. Thank you, thank you. Should be yes, awesome. Always love it. You can when, see your uh, screen. Yep. Delightful. Uh, so, and I will start my timer so I don't completely lose track of time. And I will thank you for your patience ahead of time. I have a tiny sidekick. He's four years old. He's a big fan of Pokemon, and you might uh, be interrupted. Pokemon karaoke mon. Yeah. So, hi. So nice to meet you all virtually. Thank you so much for having me here today. And uh, like Kevin said, my name is Elisa Davis. He didn't give it away, but uh, you can see here now, I am a lead business intelligence analyst for Discover Financial Services. Kevin's my boss, and that makes me really happy. I get to work with Ashley and some other great folks who I've seen on the call. And um, I get to viz for work all day, every weekday. And it is delightful to have a job that I look forward to doing. Um, so, and yeah, it was recently announced that I am in the new cohort of people who have been officially anointed as a Tableau Public Ambassador, along with all of these amazingly crazy talented giants that I would not have guessed when I started my Tableau journey that I would end up in a photo collage with. Um, you know, the Tableau public community is a lot of how I found Discover. It's actually all of how I found Discover. Um, and uh, my buddy Kevin Wee is down there too. So we get to hang out and, uh, you know, like he and I kind of knew each other through Twitter and Tableau public and various community projects. And he's the one who passed my name along to Kevin Ford and said, hey, I heard Elisa might be looking. Uh, so it was really fun. It's his first year in the ambassador program as well. And I joked with him when I told him that I had said yes to the job offer that we would get to geek out about uh, Viz stuff in our, in our work chat instead of in our Twitter DMs now. And that has turned out to be just as delightful as anticipated. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my journey today and go all the way back to the beginning where we all started, the blank workbook. Somebody at work says, oh, you're getting Tableau. And you're like, cool, I guess. And uh, you open it up and you're like, this looks like it does a lot of stuff, but like, how does it do anything? <laughs> so that's where I was back in 2018. I was a kind of a fundraising data analyst for the University of Nevada, Reno at the time. Uh, the data analyst part of it was a tiny part of my job. Like we, the, the background of that was more like that whole field is sort of like librarians who got into helping fundraisers figure out what they needed to know about people before they went and talked to them. So like, we had kind of been working towards data analysis, but I was definitely an accidental analyst at that point. Um, we were not in the IT team. We were not working for end users who liked spreadsheets. I made that joke once about like, oh, I love a good spreadsheet as much as everyone else. And they looked at me like I had three heads, um, <laughs> which, you know, like uh, now that I'm at Discover and everyone loves spreadsheets, I can make that joke again. <laughs> but um, but so the point of the story is that I understood that Tableau had amazing potential and that I was going to 
like personally need a top to bottom introduction to it. So I convinced my work at the time to send me to uh, San Francisco and my whole team, all three of us did the Tableau Desktop One course, came home and got to work uh, reinventing reporting at the University of Nevada, Reno. So that was fun. I learned a lot about data culture and people who do and don't like change and uh, reports as cultural artifacts. A uh, fun side note is that my Tableau career is almost exactly the same age as my son. I'm pregnant in this picture and just showing a teeny tiny little bit. And, um, and now he comes in like, bugs me while I'm working and tells me, mom, you're done working. Or is uh, more often like, mom, can I do tablet if you're gonna work? And that is also a thing that happens. So I got a proof of concept, got approved for more desktop training, but I was really just sort of learning the ins and outs of data, working with data, um, discovering user requirements, uh, trying to learn how to get people to do what you want, even when you're not in charge of them, which was, you know, like a lot of sort of the people side of the data stuff while simultaneously also learning about sort of like working with the people who work with the data, communicating with SQL developers to say like, hey, I need this field to do this thing. Is this even possible? And so really growing my skills internally I hit a point where I knew that I had, I knew that I loved data visualization, that it was super fun and I wanted it to be uh, kind of a center piece of my next move. And I knew that I was ready to make a move. And so that's the point at which I joined Tableau Public. And really that was sort of the beginning of history. So this is what Tableau Public looks like when you first join. Um, mine looked like this for a year or two. I think I had made a Tableau Public page the first time I had gone to conference, which was in 2019 before COVID. And then there was COVID and then nobody had spare energy to do anything. So it was just kind of this thing that had been looming over my head as a should. Um, but not a thing that I really knew how to get started with. I had looked at Makeover Monday and been like, this isn't data that I care about. So it's hard for me to get going on spending personal time or even like taking some work brain to think about something different and try to focus on it. So conveniently, uh, you know, much like office space, my, my, <laughs> work moved me from a beautiful window view of a quad down into a dark basement and that was the day that the light went on that you know my skills were never going to be respected and valued where I was and it was time to make a move and so I was browsing around on skill building classes because I wanted some structure and some accountability all of that kind of thing and it was the very day that uh, Millennials in Data Boot Camp run by Chantilly Jaggernoth who is a Tableau, a Tableau visionary was starting and I shot her a note and said, hey, is there still a spot for me? And she said, yeah, of course, I'll send you the link. Um, we start tonight. And that was the beginning of my new life, more or less. Um, so I joined Tableau Public. Uh, that course, you, what really attracted me about it was that you had to turn in your homework on Tableau Public. So it was every other week and it ran for 16 weeks. So I knew that like come hell or high water, I was gonna have eight visits in my Tableau public portfolio and hopefully have learned some stuff. Although like I felt pretty competent as a developer at that point, I'd been doing it for three or four years, but um, I underestimated the value of having a community, of having a routine, of having a schedule and of like hanging out and watching someone viz who is really among the best of the best in the world at the tool. So all that was super fun. Um, as it wrapped up, Mo uh, Makeover Monday was on a break. So there was this sort of like proliferation of data projects that was just getting going. Um, the, uh, Eric Balash announced that Back to Viz Basics was starting up and I was like, oh, this is great. You know, like he 
was also a millennials and data trainer, although he worked with the student cohort, not the professional one. So I was like, oh, this guy seems cool. He probably knows what's what. It's every other week. And like, who couldn't use a brush up on the basics? So I committed in my heart to participate in all of them. Since I had gotten in on the ground floor, it was easy. Um, and the, similar to the, uh, the homework that I'd done during the class, I was just going to get it as good as I could in the with the energy I had in the time frame that was allotted and if I got it to 80 percent 80 percent happy with it I was going to let it go and move on so that was and then they announced Iron Viz in January which was a surprise that timing has moved around a lot and I was like oh I don't have the time I don't have the energy I you know, I was in a new job at that point that I was beginning to realize wouldn't be a great fit. But I was also like, you know what, I'm going to do it. There's never going to be a better first year for Iron Fizz. So I pushed myself. I got something out that I was really proud of. And uh, it was disqualified for being off topic because the topic was art and my viz was about the culinary arts. I did a deep dive on my favorite cookbook and it was deemed a cookbook viz. Um, in retrospect, I'm fine with it. Uh, I, I have a tendency to uh, see larger patterns and maybe be a little more creative than uh, could strictly fall within the lines. and. Uh, and I got a lot of people on hashtag team culinary arts. So I think I made as many friends by getting disqualified as I would have if I had just been, you know, another sort of bright newcomer to the, the Tableau public scene in the competition itself. Um, I went to the Tableau conference in person in March of this year, and it was amazing. I had been as sort of just a regular Tableau user, but when I went back as someone who was connected to the community through Twitter and everything like that, it was just a whole different experience. It was like somewhere between summer camp and a family reunion and a party, except I didn't enjoy summer camp and family reunions are full of weird uncles. So like this isn't a great uh, metaphor, except for that it was a blast. And I kept wandering around being like, wow, all of my my Internet data friends are they're people, they're people in real life and they're just as nice as they were on the internet. Um, and I was also shamelessly job hunting at that point. Uh, I had so many conversations where people were like, oh, you know, who do you work for? And I'm like, well, I don't viz for work. I took leave and paid out of pocket to come here. I would like to change that. Do you like your job? Do you like your team? Do you know anyone who's hiring? And one of those conversations was with Kevin Wee, and there wasn't a spot on their team at the time, but when they got back, uh, it turned out that there was going to be one. Long story short, I joined Discover, and shortly thereafter, both Kevin and I were named Tableau Public Ambassadors. <laughs> and I appreciate you guys leaving your cameras on for uh, the fist pumping. So how did that happen? Um, it was Tableau Public, and it was Twitter. Is that a question, Kevin? No. <laughs> oh, it's clapping. Gotcha. Uh, it's supposed to be clapping, but it doesn't work <laughs> the way that uh, Teams does. <laughs> right? Um, so it was all about Tableau Public. It was also equal parts Twitter, which, like, you know, I, I've kind of felt like Twitter was a strange place even before it was recently purchased by Elon Musk, but it's where everyone's hanging out. And um, and once you sort of get to know who who's there, it's like the foyer. It's like the water cooler. If LinkedIn is where you put up a beautiful poster, it's like your headshot, you're very professional and buttoned down. Twitter is like, where you go after you finish a really hard test and you want to just talk about how it went. You know, it's study hall. It's, uh, you know, it's like nerds hanging out talking about nerd stuff. And, um, and it's delightful. So, uh, and I really didn't want to do it, but I asked Chantilly, like in our wrap up Q&A, 
where we were all just hanging out, I was like, so do you, if you like, if you want to be data fan, like if you're really in this because you want to make connections in the data community that could lead to your next job, do you got a Twitter? And she was like, well, yeah, <laughs> you don't have to stay forever, but it really helps to get started. So, um, but what I found out was that it's fun. It's about community. So all of these smaller community initiatives got started within the past year or so. And when you finish your viz, you post it to Tableau Public, you go over to Twitter, you tweet about it, and oh, <laughs> so this is how old my Tableau career is. <laughs> <laughs> it's gotten much noisier over the years. Um, what, do the dots what do the dots there do? So these are all people who are listening to me talk about these pictures. Oh, the one with the control is Data Plus Music, which is a fun community project all about music. I did that one when they were doing a crossover with Games Night Viz, and I did a very artsy viz that my husband, the ecologist, looked at and was like, what, what does it mean? And I was like, but it means it's pretty. We took uh, MIDI data and turned it into files and then visualized it. Oh, goodness. What? No, not Benji. <laughs> So, on the plus side, my son thinks that Excel is a game where you color in little rectangles and type numbers in the boxes. On the minus side, sometimes I give him my wireless keyboard as a distraction. So, that was, uh, Benji has that. And now we've hopefully bought ourselves enough time to finish the talk. So, I tried a whole bunch of different things always doing Viz Basics, but sort of sampling and looking at all the other data sets and just doing the ones that seemed fun. And before I knew it, there were like 35 different Viz's on my Tableau public profile. And it, it was just fun. And it was great when I was looking for a job to tie in with your theme coming up because when people posted openings, I could reach out to them and say, hey, here's my portfolio. Does it seem like my skill set might be a fit? And people would look at it and be like, hell yeah. Or they would be like, how's your sequel? And my sequel, friends, is mediocre. So that pretty much, uh, you know, split the difference in terms of like positions where I might be a good fit and positions where they're really looking for somebody with a different skill set or a different emphasis. Um, and then I landed here at Discover. This is the team. We recently launched a Tableau public page. And uh, it's fantastic, which I know I've said a couple times. Um, but I think that the advantage of putting yourself out there in public, even though it often feels scary to get started with, is that like on the one hand, people know who you are and what you can do. On the other hand, people know who you are and what you can do. So if they're hiring you based on that, like it's been really easy to fit into the team here. And I think a lot of that is because they knew who I was and the kind of thing I could do um, before I walked in the door. So um, next steps, I agree with Jeff Platner. Um, if you wanna grow your Tableau skills, follow the community, take a training, or there's tons of free resources out there. So much good, completely free stuff out there put by the data fam. I personally needed the structure and support and accountability, um, but if your brain, hey bud. <laughs> but if you're somebody who can do more of this self-directed learning, like the, the information is absolutely out there. Um, read up, practice, and uh, back to Viz Basics, 
I'm going to drop a plug in there. So I did so many of them that when I bumped into Eric at conference, I was like, hey, uh, I love the project. Have you thought about adding any co-leaders? And he thought about it and was like, yeah, sure, let's do it. So I've been co-leading back to Viz Basics. I give feedback on Twitter and I'm not completely swamped, um, which has been recently, uh, but I'm going to get back into it. And um, the concept of the project is that we have squeaky clean data and a really limited prompt we release every other week. And you just go through and, you know, like build a heat map, build a dot plot. The cool thing about the project is that we've built a catalog basically um, through the course of the year. So each challenge is tracked in the tracker. And you can click through for many of these to a viz. I'll help you in just a sec, kid. Um, we've gotten tons of viz of the days out of the project. I'm pretty proud. I came on board right around here and we've gotten viz of the day for almost every week since then for something out of the project i've also gotten some feedback that the project has gotten much more complicated and kind of serious so we're trying to swing back and forth between um you know build a tree map with star trek data using annotations effectively was a, a usaid uh violence against aids workers data set um use a parameter was just about tall buildings. So we try to mix up sort of the, the complexity and whether it's silly or serious. Um, but I can attest to how amazing your progress can be because just having been experienced to thinking really seriously about one particular skill or one chart type for the course of a year, if you look at my last in or my last attempt at Iron Viz was just in January. Um, and if it ever loads, you know, we've got some dots, but mostly it is bar charts and text tables and text tables with bar charts. And this was like the most technically complicated part of the Viz. You know, I've got some parameters, I've got some set actions. It, uh, as an ode to my family, tells you how many dirty dishes you'd have at the end of cooking on that menu. Um, but from a technological standpoint, it's pretty straightforward. This one that I just finished the other day, you know, you've got your KPIs, but then, uh, you know, tons of different chart types. Again, a lot of dynamic interaction. Um, but when you start getting down into the analysis, we've got line charts, we've got scatter plots, we've got bar charts, we've got this fun little sort of a cluster thing with a marginal histogram. We've got a heat map with a marginal histogram. We've got a tree map inspired. I don't even know what to call this thing. So I just felt like the resources that I had at my disposal when I was building this were so much more broad and diverse. And I really attributed it to uh, the practice that I've gotten through back to Viz Basics, both doing the projects and you'll see over here in my uh, work in progress graveyard that since I joined the leadership team of the project, I've had much less time to actually finish and polish the Viz's, but I've got usually some sort of proof of concept and then I get to see all of the amazing things that the community does with the data as things roll in in Twitter and the tracker. So. Um, Highly recommend anyone who is looking to level up their skills, just get out there. There's a Tableau public project for everyone. Uh, Wingspan is easy to play and difficult to beat dash at. <laughs> um, yeah, it, each turn you pick one of four actions, which is pretty the, taking the actions is straightforward. Choosing which one to do in which sequence has got a lot more nuance. Um, but as a cool kind of like like finishing story, 
I tweeted out about how the build had gone and uh, tagged the game designer and thanking her for making such an awesome game. And she read the whole entire thread and commented on several of my points of analysis. So now I've got those screenshots straight from the game designer of this like hugely popular game that sold more than a million copies. And she really sort of appreciated my extra nerdy approach to it. So um, yeah, and I'm happy to take questions either now or at the end, I can hang out. Um, but yeah, Tableau Public is great. Um, building vizs and putting them out there made me more creative and more versatile as a designer, put me in touch with people who appreciated my skill set. And um, now I've got a great job. I get to do what I like and work with friends. So. Very cool. Thanks, Thanks for sharing cool. with us. <laughs> Does anyone have questions for Lisa? I'll, uh, I'll read some stuff from the chat. So uh, definitely a lot of support for um, uh, presenting while dealing with uh, children. That's not, not an easy feat. Uh, you got a, we, we are fans of Pokemon from uh, Daniel. That was a good one. Um, definitely a couple, uh, you know, kind of like impressive comments. Uh, Tom chimed in about, you know, uh, Jeff is a big deal, big damn deal. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to probably look him up. Um, and then uh, William Brown was asking, right, is wingspan as complicated as it seems? And I think that's what you were kind of getting in there towards the end. <laughs> what is the essence of Tableau? Um, for Ooh, me, man. Tableau is the first tool that I've bumped into that works the same way that my brain does. So you can have this combination of text and analysis um like uh one of the things that so i started putting that viz together last friday and it was due monday at midnight and people in the data fam were like how did you do that and i was like well overthinking everything is a huge advantage when it comes to creating a long form viz in a few days and also lots of practice <laughs> And it was not as good as it could have been if I had gotten started on it earlier and taken more time. But so I think that the essence of Tableau, it kind of blends data with art and brings in a creativity and a community element. Um, you know, at the end of the day, their motto of see and understand data uh, fits. And um, the other essence of Tableau is like, God, I wish we had spell check. <laughs> but they are telling us that there's now a team that uh, internal to Tableau that's dedicated to making some of these uh, user requested enhancements. So I have my fingers crossed that some of these uh, tiny delights will be rolling out in future releases. Yeah, I like it. Yeah, uh, that's one of those like everyone jokes about like they don't have spell check. But like if at the next TC conference, right, that's a devs on stage, people will be throwing chairs at how excited they are. Right. right. <laughs> I'm like, it'll be like, it'll be like when we could control padding. I was, I was actually there in Austin when that one launched and I was like, oh my God, I don't even mm. know what we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and now I greedily want to be able to change the padding on multiple containers at the same time. Wouldn't that be the next level? Yeah. Drawing <laughs> circles is going to be a big one too when that comes mm. around. Yep. Ooh, it curved lines without having to do it in prep. Yep. Um, but yeah, so essence of Tableau, it's it's nerds having fun on the internet together, at least as Tableau public. And then the essence of Tableau itself, I think it's power to communicate insights effectively and concisely to either executive or non-technical audiences and give people enough control over what they're digesting as well as visibility into the underlying data if they really, really need it. Um, it's super powerful in a business setting. And you know, like even if they wanna take it back to Excel at the end of the day to keep working with it, as long as what they're taking back to Excel is different than what they started with and it's a much more focused question, I don't care. You can have the Excel workbook. 
I want it to, honestly. <laughs> so. Awesome. If there are any other questions. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Tableau dashboards are great for executives. Um, the question is, one. I'm in sales ops and we're just adopting Tableau. Um, yeah, you can build one viz for a whole bunch of different le levels of audience. Uh, and, um, and it's great because you can give just the top level to the execs and then kind of design it with drill down so that every user who needs it gets a different experience with the information that they need. Yeah, and Matt, Matthew, I don't know what you go by, but yeah, if you want to hang out in the, the networking, right? Some of us that are actually like, so we have content that goes to execs daily. So we can even tell you a little bit about our experience of uh, how do they consume, how involved do they get, right? And how the, the drill down that Elise is talking about, be more than happy. Cool. <laughs> Uh, let's see, what is the competition like to become an ambassador? You gotta imagine it's fierce. <laughs> I don't know, cause I got it on my first try, but I also went all in, as you saw on Tableau Public within the past year. So there are about 300 Tableau ambassadors worldwide. Um, they do try to do make it a, a global audience and a, a global group of people. Um, I think a lot of the things that I had going for me were I run a Tableau user group in my old field, Advancement Research. I co-lead a community project. I've been a Tableau public featured author. Um, I'm active on Twitter. I have a little baby blog. So, and I've also been really open about the fact that like Tableau public got me the job that I have right now. So I kind of like, come forward as someone who was both encouraging people who were newer to the field. I, it, it was recent enough to me that I remember what it's like to just be getting started in Tableau Public and talking about your work and being comfortable with that aspect of it. But I've also had enough success that I can sort of like speak to what it's like to be good at this tool or, you know, like at least be good at figuring out how to do stuff before they realize you don't know how to do it yet. Um, and that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, it's, it's joking aside, uh, it's really an honor to have been named. And what I like about being a Tableau Public Ambassador is that it gives me a platform to cheerlead people who are just starting out on the journey. So, if you are inspired by this talk to do back to Biz basics or any of the other data challenges or to just go out and find something that you're passionate about and visit and uh, start sharing it, please tag me on Twitter if you venture over there so that I can give you a warm welcome to the data fam. Um, I really have fun cheerleading people and finding new talent. So uh, let me know if you show up in public and I'll, I'll show you around. Ooh. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to add uh, to what you were saying about uh, users and the, their attempt to try to put all that hard work into Excel. And yeah, it's a it's a hot tech, right? Like, uh, but to be honest, it's just fine, right? As long as the dashboard is doing its work, helping them do some action items at the end of it. You know, it's a story. If it's getting them to that final element, I think it's fine for them to end up doing something completely different after that. I mean, that's what happens after you read a book, right? Like the book gives you a storyline and then mm -hmm. you end up with certain thoughts, but then you're able to take those thoughts into something else. And that's totally fine. Yeah. <laughs> right, like no one gets upset if you read your book and then blog about it. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> I had all these words and now I need more words. Fantastic. It's engagement, right? <laughs> exactly. Ooh. Awesome. We want to switch gears. Wow, I just had a cat jump out of my lap. <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks, Lisa, for presenting and talking to us. My um, pleasure. For the remainder of our time, Ashley and I are going to tag team on talking about um, some data viz history. So I'm going to get us started. And then Ashley's going to close us out with a presentation that she's got. Um, 
So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Tell me y'all can see that, right? Yeah. Cool, cool, cool. All right. Um, I originally gave this talk to a bunch of architecture and design students at the or er, at Miami of Ohio University a couple years ago. Um, the reason I gave this talk is because uh, a friend of mine from graduate school, for those who don't know much about me, I went to an architecture grad school studying urban planning. Um, and one of my colleagues from grad school came to me and said, hey, um, I feel like I should be talking to my architecture students about data and data science and data visualization because I feel like that matters a lot to the architecture industry, but I don't know how to talk to them about it. You know our industry and you also know the data industry. Can you come talk to us and tell us what's important or what we should know? So a portion of this presentation I won't go through because it covers very basic things about data that I assume most of, if not all of y'all are already familiar with. Um, but what I will cover is some of the basics of um, data visualization history. And there's a lot of different ways to tell the history of data visualization. So we're going to hear from Ashley some tidbits and different things. I don't think there's one way to tell this story, but you'll notice common threads from our stories, as well as I think if you heard anyone else present this, say Steve Wexler, who's one of the great storytellers of our industry, Steve will probably have some of these things in his presentation as well, but might tell some of it differently as well too. So um, without further ado, I'll jump into that. So um, here's a little bit about myself. This information is already dated because again, I uh, gave this presentation a few years ago. I've been with my current company, CCC, for the last four years. And actually I don't work in data visualization anymore. I'm now a UX designer um, on a uh, UI UX team. Um, but I do head up our, um, we call it informatics or in informatics team. Um, what that looks like is just anything and everything that has data visualization in it in an app format, I'm involved because uh, I'm the only person who seems to like charts. So um, anyways, a little bit about me. I won't tell you or bore you with some of my uh, uh, inspiration. I think I probably even told some of y'all about that before if you were here for previous presentations. So um, let's talk about big data and design. So data visualization as we know it has really only emerged probably in the last like 30, 40, 50 years. And I'm thinking about specifically visualizing data with a computer. Um, there's a rich history of visualizing data without a machine doing that work. And I'm going to talk a lot about that today. Um, one of the other things that's happened in the last few years, and we've literally just heard this I'm an example of this as well, is that data visualization really was nested with um, statisticians and mathematicians for a very, very long time, scientists maybe. Um, it's a relatively new phenomenon for so many different people in so many different vocations to be using data visualization as a core component, if not at least an ancillary component of their careers. So we're truly in a unique time right now in which everyone is visualizing data and everyone understands to some degree the importance of, of making sense of it. Um, things that are important about data visualization, I won't cover this in great detail today. If you care to learn more about the design concepts of data visualization, I highly recommend checking things out like uh, Gestalt principles, color theory, um, other like design fundamentals from graphic design. Um, I won't cover this in great detail today either, but the Bauhaus movement is another place you can go to kind of understand how design coalesces around an industrial object um, and how we make sense of those things. So with all those caveats aside, I can kind of jump in. Um, this is one of the oldest, if not the oldest data visualizations that I'm aware of that I could find. Um, and this is a ledger table from um, Egypt in uh, 2500 BC. Um, so what we are looking at, what we think is probably going on here would have been uh, in a marketplace of some kind or keeping track of uh, produce, grains, resources of some type. Um, but this is keeping track of debts. So someone had paid me for these things or someone grabbed X amount of grain and I need to go get that um, I need to go get payment back from them at some later point. So we see at a very early stage of human development, this need to kind of document information 
that I can then come back to a little bit later. And while this might not be data visualization explicitly, we do see kind of the birthplace of this concept of the Excel spreadsheet, so to speak. We're keeping information in some sort of a structured table where we can kind of reference certain lines and rows to make sense of it. And I think this is probably an example of where this all kind of fundamentally starts. We could also talk about currency as another place where that starts, but uh, maybe another discussion for another, another time. Um, fast forwarding quite a lot, um, we start to get into solar charts. Um, there's evidence of solar charts existing way before the 10th century. This is just an example that's available. Um, we have examples of um, many Middle Eastern cultures in the BC eras um, also visualizing the, the movement of stars, um, but we start to recognize patterns and see that stars end up in the same places at certain times of the year. We notice that the moon goes through phases and cycles. That's another thing that people start to realize, hey, we can visualize that information to start to derive meaning from it. People start writing it down. We start putting it into books uh, and start trying to make further sense of it. So in this case, we're looking at a solar chart here. It's looking at different movements within um, the sun across the sky, as well as like uh, sunset, sunrise, et cetera. Um, we then see this use of sunspot uh, documentation. Um, what's different before is like in this case, we're looking at uh, patterns. Um, in this case with sunspots, we're, we're actually collecting data now. We're looking to collect that information, which might be collected in a different place and then translating that into a visual to communicate that information to somebody else. And so even in the sixth century, probably also again before this, but even in the sixth century, we start to understand as a collective society or as, as humans are evolving, um, the need to communicate complicated information to other people in simplified formats, which is at the core of what data visualization is all about, taking complicated data and information, translating it to a graphic that someone can kind of hold, touch, feel, move around, whatever. Um, maps are another good one. Like I said, I have an a background in urban planning. So maps are near and dear to my heart. If you want to really get me going, uh, give me a beer and then ask me about maps and data projection on maps and visual pre uh, presentations of maps. I love maps. Um, maps become really, really important as humanity starts spreading out. And I, the core component of what we were doing with maps for the most part um, is navigation, nautical navigation, for instance. Um, for those that maybe know things about the Mercator projections or other types of projections, we live on a sphere. And in order to flatten that out into something that's a rectangle, we have to distort portions of the sphere to get that. And usually with some of those projections, we sacrifice some fidelity somewhere uh, in order to get to that place. So just in that alone and doing that alone, you're manipulating the way that the information really exists to translate to something that's more utilitarian that we're doing something different with. But again, it's all nautical maps for the most part or localized land maps for navigation. It's not until a little bit later that we start actually visualizing geographic data. And we'll, we'll talk about that here in just a second. Um, this is one of the first kind of like line graphs that I was able to find. Again, I'm certain that line graphs existed well before this. Um, this is looking at the um, deficit balance of trade imports in Denmark versus Norway, and then eventually seeing how the balance now favors England at the back end of that. Um, and a lot of data visualization in this particular area, we're thinking like around colonialism, moving into like the heart of colonialism. Um, for better or for worse, was run or supporting a lot of those government systems coming from European nations. So for instance, here, a lot of this state of visualization is being used to understand the effects of that colonial trade, understand the effects of uh, commerce and mercant er, mercantilism um, as that kind of spreads across the Atlantic Ocean. Um, so you're going to see a lot of this visualization coming up from like the merchant class on up and usually probably also reserved mostly for um, 
kind of like elite classes on. What's also interesting is the transition that we've noticed here of um, early stage, just trying to write numbers down, whatever that is. Uh, we're keeping track of currency. We're keeping track of, of basic things. The bulk of data visualization kind of like from the fifth century on to about the 16th century is mostly like theologians, uh, people studying the, the stars, so astronomers, mathematicians, scientists, people that are doing like hard science. It's really in this new era um, coming into the 16th and 17th century colonialism where data starts to take more of a, a financial turn. We start to understand that we need to visualize data at a country level or at a business level or some sort of trade level. So finances really start to emerge in this era as something of a core interest for data visualization. Um, I think this is one of the most important data visualizations that exists um, maybe ever. Um, for those who maybe aren't familiar, this is w a, a William Wilberforce's data viz. I don't think he actually created it, but he used it. Um, he showed this to Great Britain's uh, parliament and also to average um, Englishmen um, as a mechanism to uh, eliminate the slave trade from um, the British Empire. Um, you can tell people that there are X number of, uh, uh, of slaves on a, on a boat, um, and there's only so much space on a boat, but it's really hard to wrap your head around you know, space per person. What does that look like? I don't, I, I, people really struggle with that kind of spatial, not to mention math, um, understanding those concepts, seeing this in person or seeing this graphic dramatically changed how parliament felt about slavery because suddenly people had to reckon with the fact that there are all of these humans crammed into a tiny space all next to each other. Um, it, it's absolutely inhumane. And suddenly having that visual in front of, of them, many people could not justify uh, slavery any longer within, within the UK. Um, and so this graphic was a major component of what William Wilberforce used to abolish slavery from, from the UK in the uh, early 1800s. Um, I'm sure most people here are probably familiar with Napoleon's March. If you're not, I'll give you a brief synopsis. This is probably one of the Holy Grail visits. Everyone talks about it in our community. I actually think it's kind of a garbage visualization, or it's at least very complicated to make sense of or understand. Um, what we're looking at here are troops leaving France, uh, marching to Moscow, and then returning back to France. And as we all know now, uh, Napoleon's march uh, resulted in massive casualties. You do not fight a landlord land war in Russia. Russia in the winter, it is a bad idea. Um, but we get to visualize here the loss of troops as he progresses across Europe into Moscow. Now, from what I understand, this viz is actually designed to be printed. Um, at the time, obviously, it wouldn't be printed because we didn't have giant printers. Um, but this is supposed to be like five feet by seven feet, like giant, and you're going to lay it out on the floor. And you're actually supposed to take like measuring calipers and understand like the very minute shifts as the line changes. Um, so it's hyper, hyper, hyper detailed, um, but it's not designed to be consumed, you know, on a small confined screen. Um, the other thing that it doesn't do a particularly too good job at is like, for instance, a bunch of soldiers siphon off into other areas. It's kind of hard to, to follow that exactly. There's also some like latitude altitude type thing that's down here on the bottom. That's also kind of complicated. Um, I think at the end of the day, this is a viz that many people see as an artistic expression. Um, and I wholeheartedly agree with that. Um, it's just a representation of, of how not all data visualizations are necessarily built to be uh, used in every single kind of circumstance or, or medium. Um, Looking at some other things, we start to explore the idea of pie charts and shapes and sizes. Um, we won't talk about this too much, but we also start to toy with the idea of like, what can the human brain comprehend? Um, so we know, for instance, like humans are really, really bad at relative scale and size, knowing how much smaller 
uh, this circle is to that circle or how much smaller this slice is to that slice is very, very challenging for us to comprehend. Um, but the degree to which a bar is off from another bar is very, very easy for us to make sense of or how far apart a line is. Um, so creators start experimenting with these different types of shapes and colors and ideas um, to create really, really interesting visualizations. Um, like I was saying about maps earlier. So this is uh, Jon Snow, not the Jon Snow from uh, Game of Thrones, but a different guy. Um, this is Jon Snow's uh, data visualization in the UK of cholera outbreaks. And for those who may be familiar or may not be familiar, um, so there were cholera outbreaks that were happening in the UK. Um, it was believed that miasma was the call, so, or cause, so bad air, or um, that people were eating bad food potentially, but that that was ultimately what was causing cholera. Um, and so usually the treatment that they suggested for cholera is not too different from what they were suggesting people do um, from like breathing bad smoke in the city or whatever is go out to the countryside for a few days and you'll feel better. Sure enough, people did feel better and then they'd come back. Um, but Jon Snow had a different thought. He said, you know, these cholera outbreaks, outbreaks seem to be happening in clustered locations. So he started mapping that data um, on, a, on a grid of the, of the street. And what he started to notice is that the more heavier outbreaks or the, the higher numbers of outbreaks were happening around um, water spigots. And so he shut off some of the spigots and sure enough, those cholera outbreaks stopped happening around those areas. Well, come to find out dumping your waste pans from your house out into the street and letting that run into where your water is coming from is a recipe for cholera. Um, so he proved the connection to human fecal matter causing these diseases, and it kind of birthed the, uh, uh, the uh, practice of epidemiology, essentially, right there. Um, probably another one of the all-time favorites within the community, the coxcomb. I think Ashley's going to talk more about this here with us in a little bit, so I won't spend too much time here. Um, but this is Florence Nightingale's um, coxcomb chart. Um, this is also one of the, probably not the first time, but one of the most important times that we start looking at medical data, uh, specifically casualties or people uh, losing lives in, in combat. But um, Florence Nightingale, as a, as a medical person, now visualizing this information, creating these charts to understand trends in people losing their lives in a conflict. Um, the US demog uh, demography of uh, slave populations, um, I forget if this is a Du Bois map or not. I don't think it is, but I think he has one of his own uh, that's very similar to this. Um, if you want to learn more about Du Bois, please talk to Kevin about it. He's a Du Bois super fan. Um, all right, getting into the 1920s and 30s, and I'll wrap up here in a couple of minutes. So I mentioned the Bauhaus movement earlier. Um, I'm a big fan of the Bauhaus movement. I think it's one of the most important things that happened to our society uh, from a design perspective and an engineering perspective. Um, while Bauhaus didn't necessarily inform data visualization as a practice from its essence and what it was trying to accomplish, um, we can learn a lot from it. So the Bauhaus movement uh, started in Germany and its primary goal or primary objective was to take these complicated um, forms of arts um, that are usually reserved for uh, the elites. So like architecture or landscape architecture or um, fine furniture. Um, they believed that they could take those crafts and distill them down to their essence, their core components, and that they could apply engineering principles to that to then mass produce um, things that would then be uh, democratized, meaning like everyone would have access to fine furniture or everyone would have access to um, a well-designed, well-crafted building. And so the, um, the school, the, the people that attended the Bauhaus were obsessed with the idea of how do we take great design, distill it down to things that we can actually quantify or that we can build rules around so that you can repeat it um, so that everyone can have access to, to great things. Um, it also built the rules for graphic design. Um, so not exclusively a school of art, although I love the Piet Mondrian here. Um, Bauhaus births concepts around gestalt principles, color theory, um, uh, uh, spacing of objects in print. Um, it also births, like I said, furniture and architecture and all these other things. 
Um, and many of those things, because we're bringing engineering components to art, we now get to visualize that information, that data, uh, you have more measurements, things like that kind of flowing around. So you've got kind of data floating around in this design at, uh, ecosystem for a period of time. I'm going to fast forward here a little bit. Um, the first database was invented in the 1960s. Um, pretty wild. I didn't realize that he was alive during the Obama administration, but here he is receiving an award from President Obama. Um, then further, uh, here, I'm going to hide this. I don't know how to move that. Cool. Uh, looking at uh, computers uh, making their mainstream, here we have Margaret Hamilton. She's one of the primary coders on the uh, Apollo project. Um, so we see the birthplace of coding here as well. Those things kind of come together in the 1970s when we have um, SQL coming out of IBM. Uh, the first personal computer comes out in the 1980s. And I think probably the birthplace of democratizing data visualization for all people to have access to, we finally get to the 1990s and we get the GUI, the OS and Microsoft Office, which means we all got Excel. Um, and Excel really is like an insane product when you really slow down and think about what it brought to people. Um, maybe originally pitched as a product for accountants or a uh, a product for people to keep track of numbers. Um, what it has reached today, if you type in just about any task plus Excel, someone has figured out how to do it with Excel. You want to send an email out of Excel, you can do that. You want to build a GIF out of Excel, you can do that. You want to draw pixel art with Excel, you can do that. Like, you can, I always say this to people on my team, Excel is the best worst thing to do anything with. It's fantastic, but it is a, a blunt object, a blunt tool. Um, so it really sets that off. You start seeing graphs and visuals in every presentation, every slide deck, literal slides at the time, obviously. Um, it starts making its way into reports. We start seeing these things in magazines more. Um, it starts proliferating at an exponential rate. At the same time, we see kind of a general explosion, um, both baby boomers going to college, but also um, the explosion of computers as well. You see this massive, massive, massive explosion of white collar work that's all centered around Excel, making sense of information and data. Um, that also coalesced with the internet, obviously, and we are now living this era, so I don't have to tell y'all how this kind of works, but Broadband and wireless also suddenly make um, big data possible. So throughout the 90s and 2000s, your big data sets were really, really limited in terms of where you could get them. Most of that storage was on-prem. Um, merging data sets might be borderline impossible depending on the size and the throughput of your system. So when we get to broadband and wireless, we really start to expand the limits of what we can do. Obviously, then we get into big data visualization with Tableau, cloud support, other things like that. And we're off to the races in terms of what we can really, really do. Um, the rest of my presentation is all of this basics or all basics on data, which I won't bore you all with. So I'll stop sharing my screen. Um, and Ashley, before you take over, maybe I just ask if anyone has any brief questions for me and then I can kick it over to you because I don't want to run out of time. I was going to ask for like the Bajas movement. So like, I actually don't know the movement very well. What, so like you talked about like what were sort of like the unintended uh, effects. W what was their primary uh, intended effect? So their, their primary objective was to take design and make it accessible to everyone through creating um, a process that one could follow to replicate something. So prior to the Bauhaus, um, if you had um, someone making fine shoes, um, that was a cobbler. And that cobbler was the only person making that fine shoe. And that shoe most likely was never going to look exactly the same as the next shoe or the next shoe or the next shoe. Mm -hmm. So what the Bauhaus movement said, and it, it's less about mass production, although that was part of it. Um, it's, so it's, it's less like Henry Ford, how many cars can we crank out? It, and it's more about Let's study what the cobbler is doing and see if we can break those down into things that we can teach people so that 
many people can become that cobbler and make that object or make that thing. Yeah. Um, so same thing with architecture prior to that time period. Architecture was reserved for uh, churches, large buildings, people with lots of wealth. Um, if you were designing a home, you were paying exorbitant amounts of money for that kind of thing. Um, the Bauhaus movement also wanted to investigate this idea of, can we use cheap, easy to use materials? Can we build affordable homes that people can have access to, but affordable homes that are beautiful, that look nice, that feel mm-hmm. well-crafted. So it was all about this, this duality, uh, again, mass production, but not mass production with the capitalist objective of selling, um, mass production with the objective of democratizing access to quality design. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Uh, any other quick questions? I know I just gave like a history lecture, so I probably everyone feels like they're back in high school. <laughs> you gave a history lecture, but it was also like a Viz greatest hits, right? So it's like, <laughs> you, had, you had both going for it. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I did see. So since the database was invest- invented in the 1960s, is that why one wants, oh, you know what? That might actually be why now that I'm thinking about it. So <laughs> yeah, uh, 1160, the first database in SAS. Uh, yeah, you might be right about that. I'd have to look that up. And I know someone at SAS, so if we also want to ping uh, for an <laughs> ad, uh, we can ask. Uh, so and many. and thank you for uh, you commenting on my guitar collection. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ashley, I think I can kick it over to you. You want to take us home? Yes. Uh, let me share my screen. Um, so kind of like Tom was saying, there's a handful of ways to um, tell the story of data visualization. Um, there definitely are some overlap in the stories that I picked to talk about and Tom did. So, you know, in respect of everyone's time, I won't go too deep into those. Um, but to kick things off, you know, um, I picked a handful of examples of data visualization through the year that I just, or years that I just kind of wanted to dive into. So uh, first, uh, I'll introduce myself. It's probably a little misleading having a uh, presentation called, um, you know, history of data visualization hall of fame and then a giant picture of me obviously sadly i'm not part of this hall of fame but uh you know i'm excited to talk to you guys today um i graduated from illinois state university in 2019 uh, majoring in marketing analytics and business information systems and i actually see one of my uh former professors on the call so shout out Dr. Ashida. Thank you so much for joining. It's awesome to see you here. Um, I've been I working hope, at Discovery I now. I hope your professor more. can make the social networking at 630. That would be super cool. Yes, uh, me too. I, uh, I've been at Discover for three plus years now and I'm on our Tableau Center of Enablement team. So what we do is we support our internal servers and our internal user community. So we work with people like Kevin and Elisa, Um, you know, they have some very, very talented Tableau developers on their team. So um, a lot of the stuff that we work with them on is more of feature requests going back to the vendors and stuff like that. We also work with teams who are newer to Tableau, getting them onboarded and then enforcing server governance, um, pushing through upgrades and stuff like that. Before I worked at Discover full-time, I was an intern in 2018, and then my hobbies include, you know, board games, puzzles, and then hiking, so I have a cute little picture of me, my brother, and my parents down there, um, just to show off how adorable they are. So, um, you know, you probably see some familiar names on here from Tom's great presentation, Um uh, This timeline is definitely not to scale, but I did want to throw this on here. You know, I'm going to start off by uh, out in 1644 talking about Michael Florent Van Landgren. And then we're going to fast forward uh, to this cluster here, which is actually known as the golden age of statistical graphing. So lots of exciting things happening there. Um, So Michael Florent van Langren was a Dutch astronomer and um, what he was really 
a mission that he had in his career was to figure out a way to measure longitude over bodies of water. Um, so he first wanted to draw attention to how this was an area that we don't really have much information on. People are giving different answers. We really need to figure this out. So what he did is he asked a group of his colleagues, he said, hey, what do you think the longitude is from Toledo, Spain to Rome, Italy? He gave them time for them to all perform whatever calculations they thought would give them the right answer. Um, they submitted back their results. And then with that information, Van Landgren created what is known as, or credited as the um, earliest graphing of statistical data. So he came out with this report that you can see over here, um, and I blew up the visual at the bottom. And really this is as simple as saying, here's Toledo, here's Rome, somewhere over here, and here are all of the guesses. Um, and what this did was it really drew attention to, wow, we really don't know a lot about this topic. Um, and then after that, a lot of minds were able to come together and work on the best way to measure this. John Snow, um, Tom touched on, so I really won't go into too much information here. I also have his famous visual pulled up. Just some um, tidbits on how to read this view. Um, it's obviously set up like a map and these thick black bars actually represent deaths from cholera um, according to addresses. So that's kind of how he was able to look at this find this pump over here in the middle, you know, if you compare it to these other pumps that aren't infected, um, things are looking much better over here than they are on this Broad Street pump. Next, which is like my favorite topic to talk about is Florence Nightingale. So here we're in um, 1858 and Nightingale is really known for her work uh, as a nurse. So if any of you, um, were nurses or no nurses, she's very well known in you know, all of your nursing history books and stuff like that. But she's also known in the data visualization community. So she was the nursing administrator for the British Army during the Crimean War. And she's nicknamed the lady with the lamp because um, day and night she was tending to these injured soldiers. You know, at night she would walk around carrying a lamp checking on everyone, making sure that they were okay and getting them anything that they needed. So during her time working during this war, she was realizing that a lot of people were dying from preventable causes. So not everyone who was passing away during the war was dying from injuries that they actually got on the battlefield. A lot of them would get a minor injury on the battlefield, go into their like doctor's camp and end up passing away there. And that's because of the horrible health conditions that they had. So they didn't have enough beds for people. People were sleeping on the floor. Sheets weren't getting washed. Um, just not enough space, dirty water, all of that stuff. So what she started doing is she started keeping her own stats of deaths and what they were caused by. So whether it was a preventable disease that they got while they were trying to be treated or if it was an injury that actually came from the war. So after the war, she got back, um, grabbed some friends and she actually created a handful of visuals and she created more than just these two, um, but these are two of my favorites. So I'm gonna talk about these. So starting on the left, this was part of her first portfolio. So she put together these portfolios of visuals and submitted them to uh, Queen Victoria. So. This one over here was in the first round of her portfolio and what it looks like, I know it's a little tough to read. Um, so what she did is she grabbed Englishmen, which is what that says, and English soldiers um, for the same age range and the same like general health conditions. And she tracked um, deaths over a certain period of time. Now these English soldiers weren't soldiers that were fighting in a war. These were soldiers who were um, placed, placed at base camps. You know, they were on guard. They weren't actively fighting, but they were still living in these like um, military huts and conditions and stuff like that. So two groups of men, same age range, 
same general health, neither of them actively fighting, you can see that the soldiers are dying at a much higher alarming rate compared to just Englishmen who are living in the town. So she submits this to Queen Victoria, nothing happens. So what does she do? She hits the books again and comes up with a second portfolio. And that is where this extremely famous chart comes from that Tom was talking about. So um, how you can read this is each slice here represents a month. So we actually start over here in uh, April of 1854. We move around this way, follow this dotted line, and then jump over here. Um, so the size of the slice represents the number of deaths and the color represents the cause of death. So um, red is from injuries actually from the war. Blue is for preventable diseases. So diseases that the soldiers were getting as they were waiting to be treated and then, or just living in these camps in these conditions. And then black is um, unknown kind of up in the middle. So I think that this is just a great example of, um, you know, you can say this information, sometimes it doesn't sink in. You can show the numbers, sometimes it doesn't sink in. But sometimes you just create a view that just communicates your topic, your goal, your mission so unbelievably well that it can't be ignored. And that's what happened with this view. I mean, I think all of us can look at this. The blue stands out um, and the blue is the color that we want to avoid. So she, when she sent this in her second portfolio, um, there was actually some action taken, which was awesome. So um, hospital conditions were dramatically improved. Um, sanitation committees were sent out to clean up drinking water. And then um, Nightingale didn't stop there. This mission of, you know, clean sanitary conditions for people seeking help, just for people kind of living, uh, was a mission of her. So she worked at maternity wards in India. She worked at doctor's tents um, in the American Civil War. So she was just out there. She did a lot of great things. And kind of like I mentioned, her stamp in history in terms of data visualization, um, you know, is just one of the many things that she's known for. So you know, if this kind of sparks your interest, I definitely encourage you to read up um, more on her. Next, we have Charles Vineyard. I mean, I don't think you can give a history of data visualization presentation without showing this Napoleon's March visual. Um, I won't go too much into it, but one thing I want to call out is that um, when Charles was working as a civil engineer, he, you know, created some graphs and charts, but it really wasn't what he was spending most of his time on. It was after he retired that he really sat down and did a lot of this work. So he created the Napoleon's March um, chart when he was 88, which I thought was pretty cool. So I also have it here, you know, we were talking in the chat, the Tableau plug here. Um, just to kind of just briefly touch on reading this chart, I know Tom went into a it a little bit. Um, the tan line is our walk to Moscow. The black line is the walk back. The thickness of the line represents the size of the army. So the um, troop actually started out with 422,000 people. When it got over here, it was at about 100,000. And then when it got all the way over here, it was at 10,000. So if you went on this march, you had a 1 in 42 like shot of surviving, which is just unbelievably crazy. Um, he also has, you know, rivers marked in here. So you can see um, every time the army or the troops approach a river, you know, these are in very, very cold conditions. It actually got down to negative 11 degrees Fahrenheit at one point, the coldest day. So crossing these frozen rivers was just a dangerous task. So you can always see a uh, dramatic decrease in the lines crossing these rivers, which I thought was pretty interesting. And then down here is your tracking of the temperatures and it ties to different locations on the way back. And then this is, uh, you know, my last slide. It just didn't feel right to have, you know, a Hall of Fame data visualization presentation without at least mentioning 
W.E.B. Du Bois. This is also, you know, a reminder to be looking out uh, for, our, for communication from us around this challenge that we're going to be doing and um, talking about in our Q1 user group. So, like I said, I went through that pretty fast, um, but there were just a few things that I wanted to highlight. Um, so I'll open it up for questions for me, if anyone has any. And then if not, uh, we can start up the Q&A or just networking, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, Ashley, I know you showed this. Maybe Kevin, if you can give us the one minute version of why uh, Dubois matters. Yeah, um, yeah, the one minute. Yeah, good luck with one minute. Um, <laughs> So, so, and, and we'll, we'll probably do this again in the one queue. So the light version is um, he start. so he, he existed 30 years after slavery ended, was actually born right around the end of slavery. So grew up in a, a uh, post uh, emancipation period. Um, and he got, you know, went to college, was, was from the North, went to college. Um, and he's credited basically with starting sociology with his first big study of as um, African-Americans migrated north, especially clustering around Philadelphia, where were they living? Where were they working? How much money were they making? How much money were they making against you know, other people that grew up in Philadelphia? And it was the beginning of actually using data to tell, tell that kind of social story. Um, then the famous part is then someone saw that and said, can you go to Paris for a World's Fair? and tell the entire African-American story up to this point to Europeans. And the visuals that go along with that are amazing. It's mind blowing. It was done 120 years ago without computer graphics, all with uh, you know, recently emancipated um, black Americans that were you know, going through college, right? all hand done, all, all in the community. And it's, uh, yeah, it's a wonderful story. It's a wonderful book. Um, and I actually texted the Du Bois Challenge people on, on Twitter specifically, like, hey, how's this year's one going? <laughs> we're, uh, we're, we're gearing up already. So uh, yeah, we'll bring, we'll bring that to the group again. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. And, and thanks for triggering me. You knew exactly what. <laughs> like, <laughs> Kevin can't keep calm in that conversation. Yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful one. Nope, oh, some, some great presentations. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, thank you all. Oh, I am saying thank you. I just put a welcome slide together. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you, great. Ashley, Elisa, and Tom. Yeah, yeah, of course. Well, if anyone else, else just anyone wants, else just want I just want to tell the heckling story. Um, so, yeah, uh, uh, Ashley and myself, and then a bunch of other folks like uh, around the community, Elisa was even involved in it too. Um, we were training 75 new analysts at Discover, I don't know, two months ago, three months ago now. Um, and Ashley did like, you know, portions of like her hall of fame. Um, but we specifically skipped the Napoleon one because we were like, ah, oh, you know, it's, it, it's not, it's not like a business biz that people would use. We got heckled. We had people <laughs> like, hey, 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 where's the Napoleon one? You can't tell a story without the Napoleon. Like, oh, wow. This is, you know, so I think, I think that's the other calibration is like, it's definitely good to revisit sort of like the history of it because it sort of gets back to what are the fundamentals of, of biz? Um, but it like it's pop culture yeah. now, right? At, like so, seeing some of these things, like people have seen them, and they it was not in an analytics class, right? It was not at ISU, um, and so it's <laughs> kind of cool to see it. Yeah, that's funny. Oh, nice! elisa has got her Tableau Journey blog. Yeah, good like, call. Literally just dropped uh, during this presentation, so <laughs> uh, hot off the press. Yeah. Bought off the press. So if you want to see a less off the cuff version that hits a lot of the same points that I just covered, uh, check it out. Cool. cool. Love it. Well, normally at the end here, we open up just to anybody. If anyone has general questions, wants to chat, uh, talk about sports if you want to. I think we're all kind of tired of the digital format in some ways too after two and a half years of COVID, but yeah, if anyone's got any things they want to talk about, feel free to jump off mute.
otherwise the four of us will just talk to each other because we're all best friends. So <laughs> <laughs> I do have a question. Um, okay. Kevin, you were mentioning that we're this is the anniversary of uh, the coming back online since um, the start of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. How has the engagement changed since even before that? Are you seeing more people coming in, less people? Yeah, I'm I'm probably the the wrong person to ask. Um, so I was. I uh, still am, right? So uh, I'm at Discover, you know, got into data viz and Tableau um, at Discover. Um, and I was more like, if I was doing a tug, I was doing the suburban one that uh, Alex runs um, and he was at Baxter. Um, and I always wanted to do the Chicago one, but like, you know, back before COVID, right? You went to the tug, right? You had to, so like if the tug was at the merchandise mart, it was like, okay, I'm in the suburbs. How do I get to like a Chicago one? Um, whereas the, you know, the suburban tug would always be like right next door, right? We would carpool out of the headquarters, right? Go to Baxter, like 10 minutes away, um, you know, go, go to like an Indian buffet for lunch and then try to, you know, try to come back to work and get something done after that. Um, COVID changed all that, right? It changed it for two reasons, at least from uh, my perspective. Um, definitely people start visiting each other's tugs because it was all virtual, right? We've, um, there was even like a, a, a kind of a giggle for a while of like, we, the, the, the Columbus, not Columbus, the Cincinnati folks were crashing mm -hmm. the Chicago one. And then we were like, we should go crash the Cincinnati one you know, to go see what they got going on. Um, so that was one where it was kind of like the geography component really melted. Um, but also like, as everything started getting hybrid and remote, yeah. right, if we did actually have a tug in the city, um, you know, my ability to get down there was there. So anyway, so I'll, I'll back off of like, I don't know what it was like before last November's when uh, Tom MP and I kind of uh, pumped some new life into it. I, it was two things before all of this happened. So it used to be a, the Groupon building and Groupon oh. had like a really big room that we could use. And usually like a hundred plus people would attend. Oh, wow. Um, really? Also, wow. It was also really hard to gauge how many people were actually going to show up because people just say yes to things all the time and then don't show up. Right. Um, and we had limited space in the room. So once we hit about a hundred people, we were like, maybe we could book an additional 25, but we really need to make sure that the room can hold. So a hundred people might show up, but also like 50 might show up sometimes. Uh, anyways, the vast majority of people that were showing up were usually also there to just be like, I have a technical problem and I'd like to talk to someone who's maybe smarter than me. <laughs> um, so we've talked about this too. And, and maybe this is a thing we should just like send out to the rest of the community is say like, Hey, what does 2023 look like? And what, what are some things maybe we could try and support? Um, like people saw value in that. And so some ways I'm like, Oh, what if we like hosted a digital thing as long as you can bring scrubbed data that we could stream or something like that, like mm -hmm. let's work on it with people on Twitch or something like that. So everyone can watch or whatever. Um, so I, we want to try and figure out how to bring some of that back. Um, the other thing about it is like, Daniel knows this cause he and I are very good friends, but uh, I'm in Ann Arbor. So like, I don't live in Chicago anymore. Um, <laughs> so it's also very weird to have me. Leading. This call right now. I, yeah, I am. <laughs> um, it's weird for me to be leading this, but at the same time, my company's in Chicago and I'm back there frequently and my professional network is based there. So we've also had these conversations about like geography is very fluid now with Zoom and Teams and remote work and all these other things. Like, should we even have regionally based tugs or should we have subject matter tugs or yeah. any manner of other things? So I, I'm at least grateful like, I'm not going to be there two weeks from now because I'm not around, but for the happy hour that Kevin and, uh, announced, I hope everyone can come because it's like the first time we'll be able to do anything tug related in person in like two and a half years. Yeah, uh, sadly, I'm going to miss it. I'm, I'm organizing the uh, potluck for my company that day. <laughs> That's important. Bring them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> a bunch of architects will be like uh why am i at this like data nerd happy hour, hour. Yeah. <laughs> uh no with worries. that in mind are we expecting to have a in-person meeting at some point yeah i i i'm feeling pretty good if we we'll have to move out the five o'clock hour 
uh, right? We always start at five to go to, go to seven, or most of that's just to give people the, the full day. Um, Discover will let us host, but they will charge us if we actually do it at that time slot. So I think as we get into the new year and figure out where's like our new happy place, um, we just yeah. might move it more into the afternoon so we can actually do it at Discover's office. I think the tentatively the February one, um, because we have so many people coming from other places to talk to that, um, that'll probably still be remote. Um, we want to have a couple of recruiters come in and talk about like, what are they looking for in talent? Um, we want to open it up to students and talk to universities about like, hey, students come to this thing to learn how to get a job, basically. Um, and then on top of that, like Kevin said, uh, February is African American History Month, and we want to do things around the Du Bois Challenge. So um, there'd be a lot of like screen sharing and presenting probably going on for that too. So if I had to guess, we'd do something in person, springish, springish, yeah. But I, I hope we do these happy hours more often too. Again, I can't always be around for those, but like Kevin and Ashley are in Chicago. We can <laughs> hold the happy hours down. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else got anything going on? Otherwise we can look to wrap up here. It was, uh, so Matthew way back in the day, meaning like three hours ago, yeah. um, was interested <laughs> in like sales dashboards for executives. Was that, mm. you still online? No, I think he dropped. Oh no, he's yeah, still online. Yeah, I, uh, sorry, grabbed some dinner. Uh, uh, you were wise. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, like I, I'm in sales operations and had been kind of in sales, like the Salesforce user group. Mm -hmm. um, and the company I was with um, just was been integrating into Phillips past year and a half. And so they're, you know, with the revenue goals, they're trying to like leverage Tableau and initially seems like they're doing executive dashboards, but I just kind of wanted to see what the rollout of that was. Mm -hmm. uh, like, does it tend to go to the sales like field at all? Um, or does it just kind of, is it just really for like a select group of like managers? Sure. I can give you my answer from my company. And then I bet Kevin, you'll have a different answer too. Mm -hmm. um, Ashley, you might also have an interesting perspective because you handle support of the Tableau teams. Um, so my company, CCC, we brought Tableau in, in 2018, which is part of the reason I got hired to the company because I knew it. Um, we brought it in first for our engineers, but we are also a data first, like big data company. Um, I think most other companies that bring Tableau in usually find some spreadsheet monkey who's needs a little bit more firepower and then someone decides hey let's get them tableau um coming back to my example here again i have access to big databases and lots of different storage uh places again because i'm in a big data company um so a lot of what my team is building or what i would build goes out to those executives is heavily engineered uh you know computer science people are doing it in 2019 and 2020, when we had a quote mature Tableau org, we started to roll it out to those um, like customer success managers and sales reps and other things like that, because we wanted to enable them to um, make their own dashboards, wrangle their own data, make sense of their own information. And our goal as a team then became still big around building dashboards, enterprise things for them to make sense of, but also building what we would call federated data sources for them to play with, meaning like data that's been vetted and cleaned, data that salespeople are not gonna have to write SQL or other coding languages to access. It's designed to be a, a lower tech threshold so more people can work with it, democratizing data, so to speak. So that's my organization's experience. We now have many people in the sales roles who use Tableau. I, I'm not sure they're using it quite to the extent that maybe myself or Kevin or uh, you know some of these other engineers um, do, but uh, it's well-loved by many, many people. I, I think, in fact, many of our salespeople don't want to go back to Excel as their tool. They'd rather use Tableau because it's more user-friendly. Yeah, because like right now, 
um, like my first year on the job, mm -hmm. you know, we were all Excel based. And so, you know, we had like a quarterly um, like metrics package that would go mm -hmm. out to regional sales directors and, you know, like for me to like pull it from Excel, like you had to like, you know, get the like filter dates right. Yep, so, yep. You, so you mm -hmm. can like download enough data. And so like, we have two new integration analysts that are like able to automate it. Mm -hmm. Like you're just able to kind of like sprint, you know, spit it out through Tableau. Yep. Um, but um, so, yeah, I guess I was, I'm just kind of getting introduced to it. So um, same exact thing in my org, by the way, just to give you a, a perspective of what your future hopefully is. <laughs> um, <laughs> so our, our sales team had to do quarterly business reviews with, with clients as well. And that data, same thing, big Excel dump, and you have to get the filters just right on it and everything. And then people set off to just building a ton of charts in that Excel workbook. You build and build and build and build and build and build, and then you put them all into the PowerPoint and it's a culmination of maybe a month's worth of work. And then you finish, you know, the Q2 <coughs> presentation and you're off to the races on the Q3 presentation. And you're just on that treadmill of, of making presentations and Excel work. So what we did is we partnered with the team and said, what are the things you're trying to answer? What are you trying to do? Let's build you in a, a Tableau workbook that has a ton of visualizations, like a hundred plus slides. <laughs> and it's connected to live data. So whenever you want to do your next quarter, you've got all the visas already made and it's already attached all the data. All you need to do is update your slides with screenshots. We reduced the amount of hours that they were spending on those quarterly business reviews by 90%. And that for us was like, let's get the sales team back to doing what they're supposed to be doing rather than like monotonous Excel tasks. Mm -hmm. And you bring up a second question there I had. This is, this is a little, little bit more on like a, business intelligence Salesforce admin we work with, but like the company that we, um, sorry, I got a thing from my manager, um, <laughs> but the, uh, <laughs> but the, um, like the problem that we also have is trying to make sure that like the data within what they're displaying with Tableau, like is coherent with like, like what's in Salesforce and other like backend systems. Um, so is it quite a bit of upfront cost with most companies on making sure that that, um, you know, like the Tableau data is syncing correctly with your backend systems? I can speak to this a little bit with the famous analyst answer of it depends. So when I was standing up Tableau um, at the university, we had a, a server, like I hooked straight, straight into a Microsoft SQL server. So I was using the same data to build dashboards as the BI team was to write, uh, I forget what, the, like make a web page, but it's made out of SQL report server, something like that. It was the same data. We just had to make sure that, uh, we were sort of slicing it and dicing it in the same way. So I think that's the kind of uh, like data governance situation you're gonna run into anywhere. Um, in terms of Tableau playing well with Salesforce, they just announced a new feature called Tableau Genie or something like that uh, at the recent Dreamforce. And I tried to stand up Tableau in a Salesforce environment uh, earlier this year, and it was a giant hassle. Um, so I have some hope that they've finally uh, solved getting Salesforce data into Tableau. And if you work with your admins to understand, you know, like exactly how various fields are calculated and which things mean what, I think one of the things I've bumped into in Salesforce instances is that they're so customizable that everyone uses them differently. No two sales forces are the same, which is a blessing and a curse. So I think like spending the time doing the discovery to understand the questions, how they're being answered in a more or less reliable and trustworthy format currently um, 
like the part about getting it to Tableau tends to shine a light on existing issues, but it doesn't tend to create them in and of itself, in my experience. I think everyone on the like leadership panel here would probably agree with this too. One of the hardest things with maturing Tableau in an organization is moving people away from their their pet data sources. Like (laughs) someone's got an access database hidden somewhere in their files that somebody made in 1997 and we just can't give that shit up. And (laughs) somebody else is scraping data from some website that they probably shouldn't be doing. And, you know, one sales team cuts the numbers a different way than the other sales team. And someone defines this metric slightly different getting an entire organization and, and to then, agree. And then the executives get, I was just going to throw in the, the joke, and then the executives get their stuff from finance, which nobody in analytics or sales is actually using as exactly. a source of truth, right? So it's like there's a top level number, none of the puzzle pieces like roll up to the number. Um, so one, getting everything centralized and everyone agreeing on the same single source of truth is a colossal amount of work and a, ta- a huge task. My dev team was 80 plus people and it took us two years to do it. Um, yeah. Now we had a big boulder to push up the hill, like, uh, but still it was a lot of work. Yeah, but on the, was the- I was just gonna say on the flip side though, right, the, the, the golden top of the mountain. So we have a dashboard after, right, that scenario that Tom's describing. Um, it's a specific dashboard. It's an email that goes out from the Tableau server. No human produces it, touches it, wrangles it, whatever you want to do it, gets in the executive's email box every morning. And it's got a rate on there of everybody who started an application at Discover's website, what percentage of them were able to finish it, hit the submit button, and the submit button actually went into the, let me figure out what the answer is. Um, I won't tell you what number we're aiming for or how far away from 100% we are. Um, But like there is a threshold that senior vice president is aiming for. The day that that thing dips down, the email's designed to actually know exactly which of my VPs is the group that actually had the dip in the thing. And if you actually then go like to that VP and that VP goes to the next page in the dashboard and then keeps going down, you can go all the way down to the individual record of the individual application and the IP address of wow. the person and the webs, uh, the what computer were they on? Was it an iPhone? Was mm-hmm. it Android? Was it a Mac big browser? I mean, it, yeah. it, it ladders all the way down and you can go specifically find out, oh, there was a tech telephony outage at three o'clock in the morning that screwed up all the student credit card applications, right? So then they know whose butt to chew out. It's not the data people anymore, right? And it's, right. you know, you can actually do it in real time uh, to go find out. As a matter of fact, now everybody gets a copy of it. And then it's like, hey, can we get the email before the SVP gets the email? And the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> everybody, everybody gets their news all at the same time. So it, like the investment is real. Um, you know, teams like ours, we do the data and we do the Tableau because our business partners love sort of the speed and the design that goes with it. Um, but when you're on the other side of it, right, there, there's, you know, like Tom said, you can get rid of all that wasted wrangling. Um, mm-hmm. And definitely if you get good designers, it's like, well, what is your question going to be? And then you mm-hmm. just follow the, bre- you know, like uh, my thinking is going to go like this when there's a problem. The web page should actually follow how you're actually going to solve the problem. And you just get speed to the solutions so much faster. And what is that new feature that's going to link Salesforce with Tableau? Oh, it's called Genie. Is there a website for it? We can throw in the chat. Yeah. Is uh, it a page probably. feature? I'm not sure. Um, okay. So you can connect Salesforce with Tableau already. Like Salesforce is a data source that you can import. But my experience in trying to do that was that uh, like one of the basic limitations with Salesforce is that there's a different table for freaking everything. And they're all huge. Um, and so like the fields that you need are in 20 different places and letting that query run for an organization of any size, just to get like, you know, you need 20 fields, but you have to query a thousand to get them. And so it just was prohibitively slow. If you want to, if you want to get technical about it and work your way around it, you can use Tableau prep to mm. merge all those data sources, but Matt, it sounds like you're not 
necessarily <laughs> trying to turn into a, a computer scientist overnight. <laughs> someday, someday, Maybe it's someday. Like, uh, it's how we all started. <laughs> it's true. Well, for what it's worth, if you're interested in diving into that, like Tableau Prep is a very interesting tool for building those data sources and then mm. sharing those with people and then making sure that everyone's using the same data source. It's a very cool tool. Yeah, because I think the issue we're running into right now is like Phillips forced like a new billing system on us and, mm -hmm. you know, like fields named aren't even like what they're really meant to, what they're really doing and a lot mm -hmm. of stuff. So I'm showing something now that's a little bit of a sample. This is on my Tableau public page and it is the like fourth, fifth version of the very first business problem I ever tried to solve, which is uh, how many prospects do we have? Where are they and what's their giving capacity? And it was designed because like I was the one analyst building all of anything that was in Tableau. So I had to make it a uh, multi-audience because I just didn't have the capacity to, to manage very many products. So you've got your KPI, you've got your filters, you can click to filter. So if you just want the big kids, you can click there. Um, but then the gift officers could, or, you know, like the salespeople basically, um, could also use it to browse their own portfolios. You pick somebody off of this list and this is all completely pretend. Um, I got the scrubbed data from a, an analytics challenge. So this person can see their territory is down here in the southwest or southeast, and you can see assignment maturity, different basically stages of the sales funnel, when they were last contacted. But then you can take this and show details, and it kind of like Kevin was saying, you can drill all the way down to the individual. Uh, to the individual level. And then I've even snuck in a uh, functionality where you could grab the most recent meeting note um, and then click through. These are all fake links, but you could open the record in Salesforce. You could click to send them an email. You could pull up the map and like pick out a coffee shop nearby. So this is what I'm kind of talking about. And, you say, you know, like it's executive friendly and it's useful to the sales rep. Um, there are a couple of other demos in terms of what you would send to executives. This is a real world fake data that I put together uh, the other week thinking about, you know, like what's the executive's question? Um, you know, the pretend head of the New York City Services Department wants to know if they're going to get yelled at, probably, uh, you know, what the information, how bad is the problem, who do I need to go talk to to get some nuance on what to say when the journalist comes after me with these questions about the uh, overdue emergency open requests, you know, which neighborhoods are they impacting? all that kind of thing. If I was building this for real, I would have another page or another drill down that kind of lets you slice and dice it so that you could see exactly who you needed to go talk to to have the conversations. Um, this is another business dashboard that I put together that's off of the Superstore data. And it's the same kind of thing. You know, you have to read these top numbers. That's maybe for the executives. But then for maybe the regional managers or whomever, there's, uh, you know, you can drill down a little bit and start to have some conversations. And then, uh, like, if you just wanted to look at tables in the East, for example, um, and you click over to this order details tab, you can see the exact, like, actual who bought what when and some more details about it. And there's tons of great inspiration on Tableau Public in the business dashboards section. Um, there are amazingly talented designers out there. 
who've also put a lot of thought into how do I represent information in a way that makes sense to all audiences. Autumn Batani is one of my favorite developers and I have heard her give presentations and she says that her core audience is whoever she's working for, but then also her mom. She says, if my mom can't use this, then my job isn't done. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, there's tons of great resources and inspiration and a lot of people who have been on the journey that you're embarking and it can be really frustrating at times. Um, but I would say it's worth it. <laughs> yeah thank you for the showcase especially that i knew there was like the the biz dashboard section but i had never been there so mm, yeah it's yeah, so cool. I, I keep seeing it like they basically celebrate something new going in there with like a biz of the day um but i've never right. like actually gone to like where they actually i'll uh drop it in our our team's chat <laughs> in addition to having it in the Zoom meeting chat. Cool. What are the topics? Got a few minutes left. Matt, actually, Matt, did we uh, cover you, overwhelm you, <laughs> barrage? Um, I, I well, I think you guys gave a lot of good resources I shared with the team. Um, and also uh, just kind of, I think what, <clears throat> it's been a long year and a half for an integration and it sounds like it's probably another two years of uh, get, having that, uh, everything's thinking correctly. I, yeah, I'll, I'll throw out sort of my blunt experience of tech over 20 years don't wait for the it seamlessly works together right there's always going to be a we're working on improving connections or making it there um you know my team is immensely successful not waiting for a tech solution to come to us um, <laughs> you know, as, as much and at least i can even attest to this right yeah. uh, uh, you know, we, we look like we're tableau people making data viz and 30 percent of our job that is true uh, seventy percent of our job is wrangling the data into a clean state, so that way it can actually get all those benefits we talk about. And we frequently get questions like, "Why doesn't the actual data engineers do that?" And then we laugh and we're like, "I don't even have time to answer that question." <laughs> um, and so, yeah, there, there, you know, I, I made the joke about like, you know, we all started like being the salesperson that wanted good data. Um, it's legitimate, right? The, 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 even the, the group Ashley's in, right? Kind of, you know, housing like a, a large platform for it. It started off as a group of people that's like, I want Tableau to work better in the HR department. And they're like, wow, you're really good at Tableau. You want to run the server? Yeah, sure. He's still there, right? It's been like 10 <laughs> years, right? He used, to, he used to be the data wrangler. So that way, like HR would have like the, what is your rate of people that join Discover and leave in 90 days? Because you need that to find the recu recruiter who's abusing the system, and we had those. Um, I forgot the, there was this other metric that was like, and it was it was the Florence Nightingale metric of like, oh my God! It, now that you can see it, it's, it's, go fire those people. Um, <laughs> yeah. I was in I was in customer service for a bunch of years, and we were making a, a viz, and then we're like, oh, there's all this weird gunk out here. This must be like data noise. It, it was people who would finish the phone call with the customer and then they would be like, I need to finish typing in the system so I capture this phone call correctly. And they would be on, in that mode for 40 minutes after every phone call. They figured out how to get themselves a free break after every phone call. And it wasn't until we had a viz of like, what, what's going on? Yeah. So anyway, it, it's one of those, I can keep preaching all the benefits, but it, it has been like, find your rag tag group of enthusiasts that are like, all right, I'm just data savvy enough to be dangerous and, and just get started with something small. And yeah, yeah no, and the, Kevin, okay. I was going to say you forgot the 20% of our job. That's just like, kind of like people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, actually doing sales oh yeah yeah yeah. we probably should do that right <laughs> well a little like the part where you're talking to your end users and figuring out what yeah. their questions really are and sort of yeah. like every you know like the first third of the build is figuring out the problem the next third of the build is figuring out how to solve it and then you actually finally sit down and open the dashboard and start uh 
you know, pulling it together and then mm -hmm. giving it the little like icing and, and cherries and sprinkles on top. For sure. Love it. Yeah, the data is used for um, determining commissions for the sales people. Mm. So they incessantly complain about you know, the back end system syncing with like Tableau and what they yeah. see. Mm -hmm. yeah, I that mean, makes, that makes it even worse when the executive doesn't have something that matches with the data that's actually being used for like, you know, payouts and bonuses and mm -hmm. who, go, who goes to the sales award uh, uh, prize at the end of the year. Um, I used to do that for pharmaceutical sales reps. And yeah, I, the pain is real. I feel it. It's really high stakes too, because you're talking about people's lives and livelihoods. Like I had yeah. the chance to overhaul the evaluation reporting. Uh, the fundraisers were getting it twice a year and it took their bosses like a week each time to put it together. Mm -hmm. And Painful. and then and nobody still particularly trusted it. And I got it up to uh, overnight. They had daily visibility on what used to be a, a twice a year process, but in in creating something like that like we had to really kind of like take the experience of the fundraiser who is signed some like suddenly you know like with transparency comes accountability which is kind of what you were getting at kevin mm -hmm. um and so like there's a way to make the data more transparent in a way that lifts people up and holds them accountable without shaming them, especially if you're getting good visibility on stuff for the first time. Um, and then there's a way to be like, well, this person is great and everyone else sucks. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's like getting back to kind of like the politics of the data and finding executive champions and getting your beta team like who is the person who is the most up your butt about like this number is wrong this number is wrong i don't need your help i'm gonna do it myself and like uh kind of getting them to be converted to be your main champion and when that person is telling someone else to look at your stuff that's when you know you've made it and if you don't get that person you're never gonna be the source of truth yeah. all up all right we're over time it's late in plenty of the time zones we're playing in. Uh, Matt, <laughs> a bunch of us are available. So like, you know, after this, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm pretty easy to find. You have Kevin Ford Discover. Um, I'm also Twitter. I, uh, a couple of us are on there. So um, <laughs> yeah, you want to continue it or hear more like art of the possible type things, um, feel free to hit us up. And with that, for the few that stuck us out the whole time, thank oh, you. Oh, we're still recording. Much. <laughs> oh yeah, we're still recording. I usually come to, uh, to, to hang out. Um, but yeah, thank you for uh, for coming. And um, yeah, happy hour. Look out for the email. Hope to see as many as you possible uh, two weeks at uh, Merchandise Mart. Have a good night. Good night. <laughs>